Good evening. We bring you greetings from the Pinnacle Church of Christ, where we're living and sharing the good news of Jesus Christ. In just a moment, our minister, Brother Chuck Monan, will be sharing from the Word of God as he speaks to us this evening from the topic, Better Things. Before Chuck comes, our scripture reading is found in the book of Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 6, and beginning with verse 1, we find these words. Therefore, let us leave the elementary doctrine of Christ and go on to maturity, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith toward God and an instruction without, about washings, the laying on of hands, the resurrection of the dead, and eternal judgment. And this we will do if God permits, for it is impossible in the case of those who have once been enlightened, who have tasted of the heavenly gifts and have shared in the Holy Spirit and have tasted the goodness of the word of God and the powers of the age to come and then have fallen away to restore them again to repentance since they are crucifying once again the Son of God to their own harm and holding him up to contempt. Let's go to God in prayer. Gracious Heavenly Father, we're so thankful for another Lord's Day, a day in which we gather together to worship you in spirit and in truth. As we come to this, the second watch of the day, Father, we pray that the words that are spoken, the things that are said, would help us to live lives that are pleasing and acceptable in your sight. Father, we realize that there are many trials and tribulations that we face in this dark and sinful world. But Father, we pray that you would give us the strength and the courage to continue to move forward in faith. We come to you tonight on behalf of our brothers and sisters who are going through times of difficulty, those that are struggling with their health, sickness, infirmities, whatever it may be, Father, we just pray that you would give them the strength and the wherewithal that they need to recover. Father, we pray especially for those who are experiencing um, the grief and sorrow of losing a loved one. And Heavenly Father, we know that long after the, the funeral is over, after all of the condolences have been made, there remains an empty place at the table and an empty place in one's heart. We pray, Father, that you would give them courage, give them strength. And Father, we ask that as we live our lives in this dark and sinful world, that you would help us to live in such a way that in the end we'll hear you say, well done, and this will be enough. We ask this prayer in the name of Jesus, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Brother Chuck. Thank you, John. Our text tonight will be in the sixth chapter of the book of Hebrews. Uh, there are very few presidents that were able to turn a phrase any better than the late John F. Kennedy. Most of us have probably committed many of his quips and sayings to memory. Ask not what your country can do for you, but what you can do for your country. Ish bin ein Berliner. You remember Kennedy talking about Cuba? And he said of that uh, country after the fiasco of the Bay of Pigs, victory has a hundred fathers, but defeat is an orphan. But one of the more witty and uh, enlightening and probably uh, transparent things that Kennedy said was uttered a few months after actually winning the 1960 presidential election. And Kennedy said this, when we got into office, the thing that surprised me most was to find out that things were just as bad as we'd been saying they were, which tells you that, you know, there's no end, I guess, to playing politics. I suspect that our current president would sympathize. Times are tough these days for an increasing number of people. There seem to be no shortage of problems on front after front. And when so much of the current news is bad, how much sweeter should be the sound of news that is good? The gospel, the UN Gelion, means good news. There's never been a time when good news wasn't prized. And this good news is really the best news of all, that God sent his son to die for us while we were yet sinners, that God made a way for us when previously there had been no way. Some today struggle to understand this. Others seem to be rather apathetic toward it. 
as Frederick Beekner explains. He says, the gospel is bad news before it is good news. It is the news that man is a sinner, to use the old word, that he is evil in the imagination of his heart, that when he looks in the mirror all in a lather, what he sees is at least eight parts, chicken, phony, slob. That is the tragedy. But it is also the news that he is loved anyway, cherished, forgiven, bleeding to be sure, but also bled for. That is the comedy. And yet, so what? So what if even his sin, in this sin, that the slob is loved and forgiven, when the very mark and substance of his sin and of his slobbery is that he keeps turning down the love and forgiveness because either he doesn't believe them or he just doesn't want them or he just doesn't care. In answer, the news of the gospel is that extraordinary things happen to him just as in fairy tales, extraordinary things happen. Henry Ward Beecher cheats on his wife, his God, himself, but manages to keep on bringing the gospel to life for people anyway, maybe even for himself. Lear goes berserk on a heath, but comes out of it for a few brief hours, every inch a king. Zacchaeus climbs up in a sycamore tree as a crook and climbs down a saint. Paul sets out as a hatchet man for the Pharisees and comes back a fool for Christ. It is impossible for anybody to leave behind the darkness of the world he carries on his back like a snail. But for God, all things are possible. That is the fairy tale. Altogether, they are the truth. You see, the news of the gospel is that extraordinary things do happen to us. Despite our sin, despite our unworthiness, despite our lukewarmness. In the gospel, God does for us what we simply could not do for ourselves. In the letter to the Hebrews, the Bible writer reminds them and us of this, picking up the verse after John had read in verse 7. Land that drinks in the rain often falling on it and that produces a crop useful to those for whom it is farmed receives the blessing of God. But land that produces thorns and thistles is worthless and is in danger of being cursed. In the end, it will be burned. Even though we speak like this, dear friends, we are confident of better things in your case, things that accompany salvation. God is not unjust. He will not forget your work and the love you have shown him just as you have helped his people and continue to help them. We want each of you to show this same diligence to the very end in order to make your hope sure. We do not want you to become lazy but to imitate those who through faith and patience inherit what has been promised. Listen again to those words. We are confident of better things. What a wonderful statement that is. So what does it mean? What better things can we expect from God? Tonight's text identifies three. The first is that we can expect a better confidence of the things that accompany salvation. It's obvious that these things cannot be enjoyed without an assurance of salvation itself. Yet in the passage that Brother Phillips read a moment ago in Hebrews 6, verses 4 through 6, a situation as referenced that has shaken up a lot of Christians over a lot of years. 
Yet the warning is given as a reminder that it is Christ who is the final hope of sinful man being reconciled to God. And for those who reject his gift of salvation, the Bible knows of no other way under heaven by which men can be saved. Today, though, many are stuck in opposing ditches concerning salvation. One ditch is the old Calvinist position of eternal security, of once saved, always saved. And there the notion goes, there's nothing a person can do to be separated from God once that person is joined to God in the first place. I listened to a preacher whom I've admired in many cases over the years uh, preach a sermon on this subject. His name's Charles Stanley. He's a Baptist preacher down in Atlanta. But Stanley did something that was just positively audacious, borderline ridiculous on this occasion. He was preaching on one of his favorite subjects, eternal security, and he went through 13 distinct passages in the New Testament that he said appear to teach that eternal security is not a biblical doctrine. And I would suggest that's because it isn't a biblical doctrine. And as Stanley went through verse after verse after verse after verse, he'd say, now it looks as if it's saying this, but it's not. It's really saying that over and over and over and over again. I thought to myself, goodness, Stanley is a smart man. But Stanley wants so badly to believe in this that he's basically pushed these verses out of the forefront of his mind and convinced himself of this. Do you realize that this is an instance that shows how ridiculous and unscriptural a doctrine that once saved, always saved actually is? Those who are purveyors of this teaching hold to the truth that even those who don't want to be saved will be saved as if God is going to save someone against their will. As the old saying goes, believe it, who can? But there's a ditch on the other side of the road concerning salvation as well, and that is the ditch that some in churches of Christ find themselves in. You might describe that ditch as the cross your fingers and pray methodology of salvation. And you know what we're talking about with that. That means after you've obeyed the gospel and faith, repentance, and baptism, but you're never really sure if you're going to go to heaven or not. And we've done a pretty poor job of raising up generations of people who should have a reasonable assurance of their salvation in the hands of God, but they're not really sure. In fact, they go to the very end of life itself, just hoping against hope that maybe I've been good enough to be saved. Let's just go ahead and give a plot spoiler. You're not. No one's going to be good enough to be saved. That's not why anyone is saved. And when Paul goes through this back and forth, forth and back litany and tug of war that he's engaged in in the book of Romans between the law and grace, grace and law, he makes that point abundantly clear. I don't know how anyone could go through a systematic study of Romans and think that anybody's going to be good enough to earn their salvation. And yet there have been some in churches of Christ that have been brought up to believe in the accounting practice of salvation. And that's when, as long as you have a corresponding prayer to cancel out each sin that you've committed, if you get to the end of life and you got one more prayer than sin, then you're in. But if your mathematics and your accounting practices were shoddy, then you might be in trouble. (sighs) Oy vey. Friends, We would actually do well to read the Bible on this point because neither ditch contains the truth. The truth, as it usually is, is in the middle. And the middle is where the Scripture is. Look at two passages of Scripture that ought to pound home the message that the Hebrews writer is trying to give us concerning salvation. 
1 John chapter 1, verse 7. If we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us from all sin. Now, right away, well, what does that mean to walk in the light? What do you think it means? I mean, are you trying to live for the Lord? You either are or you aren't. It's always amazing that we're pretty sure of most things in life, except, well, I don't really know. Yeah, you do. You know. Do you love Jesus? Are you, are you worshiping him? Are you living according to, to his commandments? What did he say? If you love me, you keep my commandments. Are you doing that? Are you striving for this? I didn't ask if you're perfect. You're not perfect. You see, in the, in, in the same heading of this passage, if we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. Of course, we have sin. But are you walking in the light? Are you trying to live for Jesus? Well, then you have the assurance that the blood of the Son of God covers your sins and forgives you. What a wonderful, powerful statement that is. Here's another one just a few chapters later in 1 John 5 and verse 13. John says, I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God so that you may know that you have eternal life. Not that you may hope that you have eternal life, not that you may think that you might have eternal life, not that you cross your fingers and just uh, wish that you would have eternal life, that you know, okay? Temper that with some common sense. Does that mean that there's nothing you can do to be separated from Christ? No, there's things you could do, okay? You could just walk away and say, I'm not interested in the Lord anymore. That, that'll, <laughs> that would make you basically estranged from the Lord. Okay, that can happen. It's not likely to happen, though, if you love the Lord and you're trying your best to follow him. God understands that. We should understand that, too. So one of the better things that the Hebrews writer promises us is that we can have a better confidence so that you may know and not just hope in Christ we can have that better confidence. Here's a second benefit. We can have a better cause. The Hebrews writer goes on to remind his readers that the service they offer to God and to his people will not be in vain. Look at verse 10. God is not unjust. He will not forget your work and the love you have shown him as you have helped his people and continue to help them. These were people who were spending their lives on something that would outlast those lives. Is that the way a lot of people today are living? Can you imagine if a future archaeologist were to unearth a DVD or whatever these technocrats are using to record things today and find out what America's top TV shows were in the year 2022. He might imagine that the zeitgeist of these days were what the Kardashians were doing, or keeping up with the Kardashians, or RuPaul's Drag Race, or Survivor, or Naked and Afraid, that, that sounds pretty interesting. Or the Real Housewives of Beverly Hills, or the Real Housewives of Atlanta, or what I'm waiting for, the Real Housewives of Maumel. Boy, that'll be a real stem winder, won't it, Ronnie? Or Temptation Island. I understand some people actually watch these things. You would usually know those people because you could trace them killing brain cells by the millions by the millisecond. But here's the thing. It seems like in these United States these days, just when we imagine that we can't get any more shallow, we manage to drain some more water out of the pool. That is not living life on something that's going to outlast it. 
That is being incredibly foolish and wasting your life on something that has absolutely no redeeming value. Listen to this from Ignatius Loyola, the leader of the Jesuits. He said, teach us, Lord, to serve you as you deserve, to give and not count the cost, to fight and not heed the wounds, to toil and not seek for rest, to labor and not to ask for any reward saved that of knowing that we do your will. Friends, listen to me now. Believe me next week. Come back to it sometime next year. Anytime your life is devoted to serving God, you have a better cause. Anytime your life is about everything except serving God, you are wasting it on something that will not last. Because of Jesus Christ and his gospel, not only do we have a better confidence, we also have a better cause. And finally, number three, our lives are moving rapidly toward a better conclusion. In verses 11 and 12 of Hebrews 6, we want each of you to show this same diligence to the very end in order to make your hope sure we do not want you to become lazy, but to imitate those who through faith and patience inherit what has been promised. You know, sometimes we get so beaten down by the world and so worn out by life, we forget the things that the Lord has actually promised to us. The inheritance of the magnificence of heaven, our eternal home, where we will see him face to face and we will be in his presence forever and ever. A dazzling future that will make enduring any trial here worthwhile. I'm not going to be like the televangelist. I'm not going to be like those purveyors of the prosperity gospel and tell you something that isn't true. And that once you serve Jesus, all of your problems will miraculously disappear. No, they won't. In fact, if you serve Jesus, you might just add a few extra problems to that. Because in my experience, I have found that those who are trying to live for God are usually the ones who earn the severest attacks of the devil. The devil leaves alone the people he already, already has. But the ones that he doesn't have, well, he doubles down on attacking those. But notice this promise in Hebrews 6 and verse 19. We have this hope as an anchor for the soul, firm and secure. I don't know what every one of you is facing right now. There are some of you watching that live out of state. There are some that live in different places around the world. And all kinds of folks are dealing with all kinds of problems. Jesus said it best. He said, in this world, you will have trouble. But take heart. I have overcome the world. What God's word is promising us basically is this, that better things await us. They might not be here tomorrow. They might not be here next week. They might not be here next year. But friends, they're coming because better things are in store for you. That is not a promise that should be downgraded or ignored or taken lightly. People today desperately are searching for any thread of good news about better things. But it's only in Christ can those things be found. Years ago, one of my favorite musicians, Ray Davis, penned a song containing some bright rays of sunshine called Better Things. Uh, I guess Ray did this on one of those rare moments that he and his brother Dave Davis of their bands, the Kinks, weren't fighting with each other. But the words capture really well the spirit of hopefulness 
that all of us should have in our lives and in our hearts. And here's what he says. Here's hoping all the days ahead won't be as bitter as the ones behind you. Be an optimist instead, and somehow happiness will find you. Forget what happened yesterday. I know that better things are on the way. Here's wishing you the bluest sky and hoping something better comes tomorrow. Hoping all the verses rhyme and the very best of choruses to follow all the drudge and sadness. I know that better things are on the way. I know you've got a lot of good things happening up ahead. The past is gone. It's all been said. So here's to what the future brings. I hope tomorrow you'll find better things. I hope tomorrow you'll find better things. My friend, know this and build your very life on it. If you know Jesus Christ, those better things are a guarantee. Let's go to him in prayer at this time. Our God and our Father, we're thankful for the better things that you've promised us through the inspired writers. And Father, even as we live in a world where sometimes things seem to go from bad to worse, and the forecasts for the future are dire and bleak, Father, we know that in Christ, we do indeed have a bright future. Father, we have a better confidence. We have a better cause. And our lives are moving rapidly toward a better conclusion. Father, help us never to lose sight of this, but to fix our eyes on the author and finisher of our faith, Jesus, your Son and our Savior, in whose name we pray. Amen.